Good day, Joe. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. Oh, thank you. It's a huge honor. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, so I have, so I've known you uh, through social media for, I don't know, a bunch of years now, and I, I'm not sure exactly how long, and I've been following you, and I've been always interested in, in what you're doing uh, in the uh, uh, online environment for learning and development and such, and so I've been looking forward to uh, asking you to join this series and to share your journey with how you got to where you are. So I have a series of questions to introduce you to the audience, and then we're going to get into the meat of the interview and the various questions which I've sent you in advance. So uh, let's begin with uh, you introducing yourself. Give us your name and tell us where you grew up. So I'm Joe Cook, and I grew up in the UK, as you can probably tell by my accent. I grew up on the south coast in a town called Worthing near Brighton. Absolutely lovely on the beach. Really, really enjoyed it. Um, and I was there for a number of years and then started moving gradually, very tiny bit north. Uh, but I'm still very much in the south of the UK. Well, thank you. So where did you go to university and what did you study? So I trained in magazine journalism, first of all, and that was just along the coast in Portsmouth, actually. And later on, it was only when I was working that I went to the Open University and started my degree there. I actually started it in psychology, and then I changed it to include some training and some management later on. Oh, thank you. So let's kind of cover your career progression since getting out of university. And uh, so tell us about uh, each job that you had and if there was any interesting projects uh, that were inspiring or frustrating or such. Absolutely. I mean, how much time have you got? Um, so this is the trouble when you get somebody who's who's going grey now is there's so much to pick. Um, so my career actually started quite early when I was about 12 or 13 years old. I was co-running a side hustle with my dad and it was all about buying and selling 8-bit computer items, which kind of led me to writing for computer magazines, which then that led me to study magazine journalism. So in that sense, it was, you know, it wasn't a proper business that made us, you know, a full time money. But I was definitely doing that. And after college, um, I became self-employed. So I did one-on-one -on -one computer tuition. I did freelance writing. And this was the mid to late 90s. So someone told me the future is the web and you should learn HTML. So I did. Uh, I got into website design and uh, did, did that as part of my self-employment for a while. And I was reviewing computer software for magazines. And it was a really key point there because my mum was a childminder. And so there were all these kids running around that could play with this new type of software coming out called edutainment. I don't know if you remember that term. Um, and so this really led me to focus much more on that education side of things. And that ended up with me teaching website design evening classes at the local college. And I just found I loved teaching. And, and I just decided that was the career that I wanted to develop. I felt like I'd landed into my career at that point. Um, but I still use all the skills from um, and the learning that I had from being a journalist, being a website designer. Even today, actually, I've been doing website stuff. So all of those things have been really useful. And after that, it was developing that career, uh, working in further and higher education. I then switched to corporate when the working conditions weren't quite so good. Uh, I got that degree that we talked about and then progressed my career a few more steps, including working with Time Warner. And later I decided to own my, open my own business again. So tell us a little bit about the business that you operate now and what, what products or services do you render to the marketplace? So it's all about virtual classroom training. So what we do is we train teams of people to deliver impactful virtual classrooms and um, to design those really well, which at the moment, you know, we had the kind of the forced pivot uh, in 2020 and a lot of people got online and kind of managed it. And some people have kind of just flown and done really well. And others, it's now a case of uh, it's not as good as face to face. It's like, let me help you with that because it really can be. So that's what we do. Yes, thank you. Uh, very, very interesting, interesting background. Uh, 
Can you, so this series that I've got here is HPT videos, human performance technology, known by a bunch of other names over the decades, human performance improvement, but it's all about evidence-based practices to help people improve performance, whether that's in an enterprise learning context or an educational learning context. But what can you tell us a little bit about your first exposure to this and how you might refer to it? Yeah, no, I didn't really know a lot about this in the first few years of my career, which is, I imagine, fairly typical for a lot of people. I don't know about starting a career now, but certainly when I did. Um, and my teaching and my training was just based on kind of what I did naturally. I just seemed to be kind of okay at it. Um, but it was based on things like researching stuff and planning and documentation and good communication. So all of that has come from learning to be a magazine journalist and having run a business. So all of those things kind of rolled into it to really important. So even when I did my teacher training, obviously that was focused on the training bit. Um, there wasn't really the analysis. It wasn't really the design stuff. You know, we covered things like the joyful learning styles, which we know research doesn't uh, say doesn't improve learning. So, you know, things like that. So probably my first exposure to it was really when I started that psychology degree, because that's all about research and evidence, obviously. And then when I realized, OK, this is heading towards being like a chartered psychologist and that's not the route I want my career to take. And I changed it up to include, you know, education and stuff. This is probably where I then started focusing on all of that stuff coming together. Although I'm not really sure I realized that at the time. Um, so I refer to it as things like evidence informed practice or evidence based practice. I really like that kind of idea. But in the most simple terms, it's what do people do at work and how can we help them with it? Uh, and I think that's the function that's the easiest to grab onto. I'm sure Paul Kirshner is happy that you use the phrase uh, evidence informed because I think that's the twist he's put put on evidence based. But uh, absolutely, but, I've uh, definitely been following some of his stuff and Merriam's, Miriam's as well. So oh yeah, great people. So before we get into uh, current day influences, I want to go back to when you first started, and for our audience, if you. Uh, anything comes to mind in terms of people or books or articles, things that were very influential that you might suggest that others follow up with because it had such an impact to you? Yeah, and I, I think sometimes it's quite personal to you on your journey. Um, but in my teacher training, there were lots of books that I had that were really academic. They were very interesting. But it kind of left me thinking of like, so what, what do I actually do in my classroom? This is great theory and great research. Uh, and I got a book called Teaching Today by Geoffrey Petty, uh, a UK um, a, a professor. And I don't know if he's a professor, um, but certainly a UK kind of academic and, and a really good educator. And in it was a diagram that I still reference to this day. And, and let me come and find it and show it to you. Because what it does is it really breaks down. People are going to hate that I fold my book back, but I have. <laughs> um, and it really highlights to me that kind of breaking down the mm -hmm. steps of an activity and making it achievable for someone. And it's also where I first learned about self-directed learning, about social learning, and all of these other things that today just kind of trip off the tongue for us. Now that book's from 1998, and I still love it today. I still pick it up and read it for those bits of inspiration. And, you know, and obviously having studied a bit of psychology, I did a couple of years of that, that's been a big influence too, and really keyed me into that scientific method and thinking critically about the information that you've got. And then couple that with my journalism background and, you know, needing different evidence sources to corroborate something. And you've got a great kind of recipe for not always falling for the snake oil. Um, and this is what I mean by it's kind of a personal thing. That was my experience. But hopefully other people can kind of go, well, I could think about looking for different resources or I could think about whatever might be relevant to them. Yes, yeah, exactly. Good, good, uh, good suggestions there. So if you were to give us a 30 second elevator speech on what you currently do, you know, to provide an example to our audience, what would your 30 second elevator speech be? 
we um, train teams of people to design and deliver impactful virtual classroom and webinar training. And I've run my business since 2013. Five years ago, my brother Mike became my business partner. So we've got a lot of experience way before COVID came along. Um, but it's really helping teams of people to go and do what they do best, but just learn that sprinkling of new skills for live online learning. Excellent. Thank you. So that's a good segue into my next question, which is, as a lifelong learner, can you share with us what you are focused on right now in, in learning? What learning curve and performance curve are you climbing? So, I mean, obviously, it's all about the live online. That's my kind of specialist area. So I'm always reading and writing stuff about that, uh, specifically things like digital body language, such a fascinating area, and trying to look at things like research reports and see which findings lend themselves to how we design and deliver our live online sessions. And it's really getting over that perceived technical barrier uh, and connecting with that human on the other side. That's a huge focus of mine. Um, and with that kind of varied career background, which, you know, if you're, somebody can get that, and it's more of a, a traditional thing for people in their careers now to have these different roles, you know, all working in different industries has just given me different experiences to draw upon. Um, I've been deputy editor of Training Journal magazine in the UK. So having been kind of almost forced to kind of like, you have to go and interview someone on topic X, which might not have been the main thing I'd like to look at, all of a sudden it's like, well, I have to go and find out about it and research it and be able to have a conversation about it. And therefore that broadens your horizons. And I think it's things like that. And also I write a little bit about those bigger ideas of kind of organizational culture and how that supports learning, which ultimately kind of helps with virtual learning. And lastly, and probably the most important thing that I'm doing at the moment is I'm just finishing up a report about virtual learning. So I teamed up with Jane Daly from PeopleStar. We did a survey of L&D people and of learners, which is really important to find out about their experiences with virtual classrooms. So we can just all develop our practice with just more evidence, which is the whole point. Uh, and it's been a great piece of learning, great insight for me. Uh, really looking forward to sharing that coming soon, very soon. All right, we'll be looking forward to that. Um, my next question, uh, kind of a pivot here, is to language, terminology, and et cetera. And as a journalist, you might appreciate this, but, but so I always ask this question of my guests, is there a performance improvement or a learning and development phrase or term that you would like to define for us because perhaps you feel it's being misused or mm. misconstrued and you want to put your own spin on it. What what would yeah. you have for us? Once again, how much time have you got? <laughs> <laughs> Plenty. But I, <laughs> I think I think I'm going to stick with this kind of whole virtual landscape um, because uh, I use the term, for instance, live online learning quite a lot. And I do, I do that to distinguish virtual training from things like e-learning modules where, you know, you do that in your own time. Maybe it's sitting on your learning management system uh, and also to contrast it to physical training um, because it's still live. Physical face to face training is live, but this is the online version of it. So those words are kind of subtle, but important. And I think the other area now obviously is hybrid. Um, it's been bubbling along for a while, but in the last kind of year or two, that's really kind of burst forth. And a lot of people use that term to mean a mix of e-learning and face-to-face -face and virtual sessions and reading and all these other different things. But for me, that's blended learning. There's already a term for that um, to describe those kind of learning interventions and programs over time. So hybrid, for me, hybrid learning is a live event again. And it's just some people happen to be in one or more physical locations and other people are remote. But it's a subset of virtual. You need all the virtual kit, the skills, the experience to make that work really well. And so those kind of areas are, are what I'm playing with at the moment. That's very interesting. So, so what advice? What what one piece of advice might you give somebody that's going after the you know the hybrid uh, approach? Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> is there a particular reason why you say that? Yeah, I mean, my advice has always been don't do it because usually one party 
usually the remote party will get the short end of the stick because you know as a facilitator with the best will in the world you're going to focus on the people physically in front of you and it's harder to focus on the people on a laptop screen somewhere. So, so the point is you, you can do it. And I have been involved in really successful hybrid events, but they take a lot of work, a lot of planning, a lot of kits, a lot of people who know what they're doing um, in order to make that work so that both parties have a really good learning experience. And this is why I say it's a subset of virtual. So, you know, if it's just you and you haven't done much of virtual training and you're suddenly you're being thrown into hybrid, it's really going to be a challenge to do that well and to feel you're doing a good job, let alone actually getting that feedback and getting that return on, on in the performance that you need from people. Thank you for that. I, I agree with what you're saying here. It, I think that's uh, very important for people to consider because you're going to shortchange one audience and it's just difficult to divide your approach and attention uh, when you're in that situation. Um, earlier, I asked about who were some of your or what was some of your early influences, but uh, so I'd like to shift gears here to more present day. Mm. Uh, and again, this is kind of a shout out for and for our audience. If they're not following these people, maybe they should. So, uh, you know, it's hard to list names and, and books and articles and things like that without leaving some out. But uh, so those who are left out perhaps feel that they should have been, please forgive us. But uh, what, so who do you, who would you point to for our audience, assuming they're fairly new to the field uh, or don't have a wide network, who would you suggest uh, that they look to? The, the first one is uh, is Kathy Moore, who does action map mapping. That's probably been the biggest influence on adapting how I come into designing um, training. Uh, it's such an elegant way to look at things. The action mapping focuses on what should people be doing at work? Why aren't they doing it? And there are all sorts of reasons. What fixes do we need? Some of which are training, a lot of which aren't. And then focus on getting into the practical elements of that training with the support materials afterwards, rather than just the, the sage on the stage and just spewing kind of information and hoping it sticks in our learners' brains. And, and other people, you know, that have been in your series, which is why I say it's a great honour to be here, are people like Patty Shank and Julie Dirksen and Jane Bozarth, amazing people. Um, more recently, also Paul Matthews, has done loads of work on learning transfer, as have others. Uh, Steve Wheeler has got some really excellent stuff on pedagogy. And uh, Donald Clark always cuts through the fluff to get to the empirical stuff on his blog. And, and a little bit like I said earlier on, I think the key is, is being kind of broad, reading widely. Uh, that doesn't mean books, that can mean articles, like you said, um, and podcasts and stuff like that. Uh, and watching videos and kind of going, what, what piques my interest and going and looking up that one thing? And the researching those different elements of things that you're doing. So I've been quite lucky in a position that running my own business, I've had to know about marketing and sales and, and all these other areas. And actually they impact my L&D practice. And what it means is when I'm talking to my clients, I'm understanding the needs of their organization a little bit better because I run my own company. So it's that broadening of the knowledge and experience, I think is the really key thing to helping with that. Thank you so much for that answer. Joe, thank you so much for doing this interview with me. I have one final question. And to our audience, for our audience, who I think are probably newer to the whole area of learning and development, and perhaps performance-based learning and development, and perhaps beyond that performance improvement, but what sage advice would you give them as they begin their journey? I think the thing is you can't skip the performance improvement stuff. You can't do poor or no analysis. You can't use outdated methodologies and then expect really great results from people at the end of it. You need to read, and that means listen, watch, research, ask, stretch yourself, do different things, challenge yourself in ways that are appropriate and what you can achieve and what you are, what is right for you at this time in your life. 
And then that all comes together. You don't think of it when you're going through it, but when you kind of come out, you know, of, you know, two or three years or you change a job role or something like that, you suddenly go, wow, I know all this stuff or I'm using all this stuff. And that's what I mean by it all comes together. And good luck, everyone. <laughs> thank you for uh, that and the luck that you wished our audience. Joe, thanks again and have a great day. Oh, thank you. It's been a huge pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.